book of Matthew, chapter 4. And we're going to jump a little bit today between Matthew and Luke. So if you want to put a marker in Matthew and put a marker in Luke, both chapter 4. If you're new to God's Word, I'll explain it to you really quick. Gospel writers, the Gospels are what we, the good news of Jesus Christ. They are the story of Jesus, and they are the first four books in the New Testament. Uh, the Bible's divided up into testaments, old and new. They're basically covenants, promises. The old covenant and the new covenant, the new promise. The old covenant being the law, the new covenant, the new promise being Christ. And so it's fitting that we start the promises of Christ with the story of Christ. Those first four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, written by very four different people. Two, four very different groups. That's why when you read them, one has this story, one has this story. It doesn't mean that they're false. It doesn't mean that they contradict each other. But as those writers sat down to write on different things, they would tell stories from different perspectives. Also, Mark was probably written first. That's why it's short. Mark sat down, he wrote his gospel. Then after the Gospel of Mark circulated, Matthew sat down and went, Mark's story is good, but I witnessed some things that Jesus did that Mark didn't write about. So Mark wrote a story, or Matthew wrote a story. Luke did the same thing. They kept expounding and expounding, right? It's, every preacher has said this before. If there's a car crash outside... And they come up and they go, Maddie, what happened at the car crash? And Maddie goes, two cars hit each other. That's all I know. Right? You're in zero help to the police. Every policeman's shaking his head right now. And it's like, those are the people we get. Oh, this car came out of nowhere. What color was the car? Like a white or maybe, maybe blue? Right? Did you get a license plate number? Man, I don't even know what color the car is. Right? But there are people who did get it. What kind of car was it? It was this make, this model, and those stories expound. Now, John, John is its own animal. John is special. Because if you read John, let me see if I can get this straight. Matthew written to the Jews. Luke written to the Greeks. Matthew being a Jewish tax collector would write to his people. Luke being a Gentile doctor would write to his people. Mark, writing primarily to the Jews, but that smaller first book. John comes along and writes to the churches. So that's why you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they're very just listing of Jesus' life. And then you get to John. And John 1 doesn't begin with, this is the story of Jesus Christ. It literally starts in the beginning, the very beginning, was the Word. And the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So John is its own kind of different gospel, but it's beautiful in its own right. So, the reason I bring that up is this. We're going to be in Matthew. We're still walking through the book of Matthew, but Luke carries on such a conversation that Matthew misses that I want you to, I want you to have all the information here. Let's look at it. Jesus is going to call his first disciples, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And immediately they left their boat and their father, and they followed him. And he went through all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel in the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all of Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and from the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Now, let's look at Luke quickly. You're going to get a lot more. Luke chapter 4, verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went out throughout all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. 
And I want you to look, if you quickly, we're not going to read all of this, but I want you to look just for a second. The next heading is Jesus is rejected at Nazareth. Jesus would go into his home temple at Nazareth. He would begin to read from the book of Isaiah. They would get so angry because he was saying that the glory had come on him. They got so angry that they attempted to murder him. They push him out to the cliffs and they're going to shove him off the cliffs. And then Jesus leaves and he goes into Simon's house. This is Simon Peter, the one that he's going to call. And he heals his mother-in-law. Yes, Peter was married. And he goes through all of these things and Jesus preaches in the synagogue. And he goes through and he's, he's teaching and he's, and he's professing himself. Now look at chapter 5. And on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little bit from the land. And he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And when he finished speaking... He said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we have toiled, we have worked all night. And we've, we've taken nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets began to break. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat, their partners, as we learned in Matthew, James and John. They signaled in their, to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both of the boats so that they both began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and they followed him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for these stories, these accounts that we have of your life, the life of our Messiah. Father, without them, we would be lost as to who you are and as to what you were like. But Lord, we read these and we glory at your majesty, at your firmness, and at the same time at your gentleness. Father, we love you. And I pray, God, that you just speak now to our hearts. God, create in us a heart of a disciple. Father, deal with those who are lost and just love us. Love us and support us. Father, we love you and it's in your name. Amen. So I was always bothered when I was younger by that story. The story in Matthew where Jesus looks at the disciples and he basically looks at Peter and he says, come you, follow me. And Peter goes, okay. And it says he, lay, he leaves everything. And I'm like, man, what kind of power did Jesus have, right? That he walked by guys and he pointed at him. He's like, you, follow me. And they were like, yes, sir. Right? And I thought, man, that's some like spooky authority. The gospel of Luke helps you out there. Jesus knew Peter. And Peter knew Jesus. There were multiple accounts where you see Jesus coming in connection with this family, right? Jesus had met his brother Andrew. Andrew had already heard about Jesus. Now, here's how Andrew knew. You find out later in the Bible, Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. And so when John got caught and got taken into jail, when Jesus came down to be baptized, Andrew was probably standing there. And Andrew has come back to his brother, and he's like, man, I got to tell you some stuff. I mean, we talked about last week the, t the, the, the temptation of Jesus. Before that, we talked about the baptism of Jesus. Imagine being Andrew, and you've been out dunking people in water with John, and John's been saying, repent of your sins. And people are like, I repent, I'm sorry. And John dunks them. And then all of a sudden, this guy comes out to the water, and John's like, I, I can't baptize you. And Andrew's probably like, man, John ain't ever refused to baptize anybody. And all of a sudden, he dunks Jesus under that water. Jesus comes up, and the Holy Spirit comes down, and you hear the voice of God, this is my son. And Andrew's like, no, oh, no. This is new, right? You know Andrew came home, and he was like, hey, man, some weird stuff happened down at the river today. And Peter's like, what are you talking about? Man, I don't know if somebody's messing with me. And then they start to hear these stories, right? And then what happens? Jesus is ministering in the towns, and Simon's mother-in-law is sick. Now, at the time, she wasn't Simon's mother-in-law. She was just a sick lady. That they came to Jesus, and they said, we need you to come to the house and heal mom. 
And Jesus walks in. Is Peter there? Maybe. But Jesus walks in and he looks at the house. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. And it says that she begins up and she begins to serve everybody in the house. Now, no doubt, Peter shows back up at the house at some point. Now, you've got your brother telling you about this guy. You've got your mother-in-law telling you about this guy. You've got your wife telling you about this guy. But you haven't seen this guy. Right? But you've been hearing all these murmurings around town, and you're like, man, what is with this dude? And then all of a sudden, this guy shows up, and you're out there cleaning your nets. Now, Peter's cleaning his nets. He hadn't caught a thing all night. And I don't know if you've ever been fishing. Anybody in here like to fish? I love to fish. You know what I hate? Sitting. That's what it's called when you don't catch no fish. Right? My kids are the same way. Man, if you, go to a, if you can go to a tank, you know where the best place to fish is? I'm not going to lie to you. I might have told you all this before. Best place in Ennis to fish, Lions Park. Lions Park. They go in there, especially if you have little kids. Y'all take note. They dump a, like a bajillion little bitty old catfish. They're like this big. You ain't going to eat not a one. But if you want to catch fish, we'll take the kids out there, you put the, the worm on the hook, you throw it, that cork hits the water, the minute it hits the water, boom, it's gone. Kids are reeling them in, yeah! We reel in 50, 60 fish every time. Now we got to chunk them right back out. Sometimes I think they're the same fish. <laughs> the game we play when we go is not who can catch the biggest fish, but the smallest. Because you'll pull some out sometimes and you hold it up next to your hand and it'll be just the palm of your hand and you're like, look at that little guy. And you let him go and the next fish, he's the same size. But we're catching them, right? You go out to the marina, there ain't no fish out in Bardwell Lake. The garbage done polluted it so bad, the fish all died. I love to fish, I hate to sit. Peter had been sitting in a boat now, not just sitting. He wasn't doing our kind of fishing. Peter was net fishing. You know what that means? All night, Peter's picking up a net, and he's chunking it, and they're reeling it in. An empty net in the water is a heavy net. I'm just going to let you know. And he's reeling it in, and he pulls it up. Nothing. Goes to the other side of the boat, and chunks it out, reels it in. Nothing. Peter's tired, and he's angry. He's sore. There is no H-E-B where he can just go buy fish, right? This is my livelihood. This is dinner for tonight. This is my manhood. This is everything, right? I'm supposed to be a great fisherman, and I'm coming back into port with zero. And he pulls back into port, and he's cleaning his nets, and he's mending the tears that he tore, no doubt. Because if you've ever seen a man get angry, I guarantee you the nets were tore up. And what happens? Jesus comes down, and in Luke, he says, I need to borrow your boat. He kicks the boat out just a little way. He's teaching the people from out of the boat. Why get in the boat? Right? You ever think about that? Why get in the boat? You couldn't teach people on land? Makes it more dramatic. You're out in the boat. Rocking back and forth. Why is Jesus in the boat? Voice carries My voice carries better, right? Yeah? Maybe. Maybe there's so many people on the land, Jesus was like, I got to get out here just so I can see all y'all, right? Here's the thing. Where do you fish from? From the boat. What was Jesus doing? He's standing there and he's preaching the gospel. He's proclaiming the kingdom of heaven. He's telling people of the glory of God. Jesus is fishing. He's showing Peter what Peter's going to be before he ever asked Peter to do it. He's showing him. He's giving them the example. Now imagine this. He's in the boat and he's preaching and people are captivated. Boy, they're listening, right? They're sitting on the hill and they're listening. Peter's over here and he's mending nets and he's like, yeah, kingdom of heaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Because he hadn't bought in. It doesn't say Peter gets saved at this point. But here's what Jesus does. He goes, Peter, pull me back in. Peter pulls the rope back in. Jesus gets out of the boat. And he goes, Peter, get in the boat. I want you to go out a little ways. And I want you to chunk the net over the side. And Peter's like, man, listen, man. We've been at this all night. And we ain't caught one fish. 
What does Jesus say? Nothing. He just stares at Peter. And Peter goes, It's your word, Lord. It's your word. I will go out and I'll throw the net over and we'll see what happens. And what happens? So many fish. So many fish. Now, this isn't a miracle because he wants to bless Peter. That can, you, could, you could construe this as prosperity gospel all over. Look, Peter's able to buy a new house on a new boat. No. He looks and he says, if you will obey my voice, if you will listen to me. Now, this is what you have to understand when it comes to this. Because Jesus is going to call his disciples. He's going to make disciples. Here's the reason I tell this very long story to get to this point. This is not the first encounter with Peter. Peter has heard and Peter has seen and now Peter has experienced firsthand for Peter and that's why when Peter gets out of the boat he drops to his knees and he says I don't know what you want with me but I am unclean I have no business being with you and Jesus looks and says follow me Andrew's already in he's hook line and sinker right you look at Peter and Peter goes I'm in and he looks at Andrew, and Andrew's like, I'm in. James and John done hauled up all these fish, and they done seen these other two. And he looks, and he goes, hey, you guys too. And they're like, done. They leave their daddy. They leave their nets. They leave everything in the boat to run and be disciples of Jesus. If you have your Bibles open, I want you to look at Luke chapter 4. Verse 14, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. That's a big verse. Jesus returned, Luke chapter 4, verse what, 14, 16. Oh, 14, sorry. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Christ is not in the business of running. The reason I put this up here, Matthew puts that he withdrew to Galilee. Withdrew makes it sound like he was afraid, like he was timid. I love the way Luke writes this, that he says, in the power of the Spirit, he went to Galilee. He went into his hometown. Christ is not in the business of running or hiding. It has not nor ever will be in his nature. Amen? He is in the business of taking incomplete things and making them complete, of drawing people out into repentance and bringing us into the light. Jesus is not withdrawing to Galilee. Jesus is coming to Galilee full of the power of the Holy Spirit. For those of you that are here today, understand this. We're going to talk about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you have to understand this, that this timid image of Jesus that we have, that, that society is trying to portray to us now, was not the Jesus of the Bible. Jesus was not fearful, except for when it came to God taking his life. Other than that, Jesus was not this scared, frail man. Jesus was strong, is strong, not was. Talk about him like he's dead. Jesus is strong. Jesus is powerful. And I'm going to tell you this, when it's time for you to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, when Jesus is in the process of making you a disciple, there's nothing you are going to do to be able to run away from that. Amen. You look at Peter, and you look at how Jesus handled Peter. He didn't just walk up to Peter and go, hey, me and you, let's go. Peter would have been like, no, you're crazy. What did Jesus do? Jesus affected everything in Peter's life from every angle to where Peter when he finally met Jesus he was like man would you get away from I have heard so much about you and I'm finally meeting you and all that was left was the last miracle just to just to knock Peter down man here's the secret you want to know how to make disciples you want to know how We've been talking on Wednesday nights about who's your one person that you want to see come to Christ and making disciples in Jesus Christ. And here's, here's the biggest secret. Number one, don't do it alone. Don't try to make disciples alone. And number two, don't just affect the disciple. I know Jacob needs to get saved. And I'm going to really start to disciple Jacob. 
right? I don't walk into the bank where Jacob works and go, hey, I know you're busy, but let me talk to you about Jesus Christ for a minute. Right? He's going to go, get out of here. Here's what I do. How do I do that? How do I disciple him? The same way Christ discipled Peter, the same way he affected Peter. I love on his family. I love on his kids. I send women out to minister to his wife. Because me loving your wife, that's weird. But you send women out to minister on his wife. We love his family so much so that the man who has no relationship with Christ is completely surrounded and enveloped by Christ. He's hearing it all the time. So that when Christ hits his heart, he's already heard of how great Jesus is. And he's already seen the stories of reconciliation. He's already seen the power of the Holy Spirit. He's just been too pushed off. It can't happen for me. And then it does. That's how we make disciples. If you have your Bibles open, read with me Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth. Now, where was Jesus from? Nazareth. Born in Bethlehem. They left Bethlehem. Remember, they went to Egypt, and then they come back to the hometown of Nazareth. Now, this is the first time Jesus had ever been to Nazareth, but his family is from there, Joseph and Mary. So everybody knew his mama and his daddy. And he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. The synagogue at those times, any male over the age of, ooh, I think it's 13. Don't get me wrong, though. I want to say 13 came into manhood. 30, you began your ministry. So at a certain age, any male in the synagogue could be handed a scroll and it was your job to read. So they hand this scroll to Jesus. And they say, Jesus, would you read something for us? Sure. He stands up and he opens the scroll. You can imagine. Everybody's waiting with anticipation. Oh, we've never heard him read before. Jesus is sitting there and he's like, you don't have any idea what y'all are doing. Rolls the scroll out and the scroll was the prophet Isaiah. And he unrolled the scroll and he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he said to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that came from his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did in Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel... In the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all of the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them but to one in Zarephath, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed but one, and Naaman the Syrian. And when they heard these things in all the synagogue, they were filled with wrath, and they rose up, they drove him out, they take him to the cliff, and they're going to pitch him over. And what does it say? Jesus cowered, and he was scared. No, what does it say? I love it, man. They took him to the cliff and they're going to pitch him over. But passing through their midst, he went away. He walked right through the crowd. He didn't disappear, not like a vapor, not like a ghost, no supernatural power there. They were like, we're going to shove you off. It was a custom. We would kick you down the hill. And once you toppled down the hill, we would pick up stones and throw them from a high place and stone you to death. They push him to the hill, and Jesus stops him before they get there. And he goes, y'all ain't doing this. And he goes, if y'all excuse me, I got work to do. And he just starts walking through the middle of them. You can imagine two guys standing there. Mad fuming, we're gonna murder you. And Jesus goes, Hey, Bub, excuse me, real, real quick, I gotta get through here. And he just walks, and he just walks away, and everybody's like, Well, fine. Jesus is not soft. And you see this here. Now, I prove to you he's not soft. If you have your Bibles open, go with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 61. We're gonna read what Jesus was reading. 
And we're going to understand why the people got so mad. And we're going to understand Jesus, Jesus' connection to what he was saying. Isaiah chapter 61, they pull it, they hand it to Christ. Christ starts to read, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. We just read this, because the Lord has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, and they shall raise up former devastations. They shall repair ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Now here's where the Jews get mad. Strangers will stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers, but you, you shall be called the priests of the Lord, and they shall speak of you as the ministers of God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a, da a double portion, and instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land they shall possess a double portion, and they shall have everlasting joy. For the Lord for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the people. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are an offspring that the Lord has blessed. And I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with his garments of salvation." He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. As the bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and a bride adorns herself with jewels, for as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and the garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all nations. Jesus looks at the Jews in the synagogue and he says, I want you to understand, salvation is coming for you if you are able to understand it. And he gives two examples from Elijah and Elisha. He says there was a widow and there was only one widow who was saved. And they go, amen. You remember that story? The Jews are like, amen. And he goes, what's interesting about that widow? Well, she wasn't Jewish. That's right. She's not a Jew. And in the time... Where the lepers came, there was one leper who came and was healed, and his name was Naaman. Do you know what's important about that leper? And the Jews go, he's not a Jew. And Jesus goes, that's right, he's not a Jew. The prophet will receive no honor in his hometown. This wasn't Jesus just talking about Nazareth. They were looking at him going, oh, this is Joseph's boy. How sweet. Right? I can amen to this. You know how hard it is to come back to the church you grew up in? Try to pastor people that look at you and go, you know, when I look at you, I still see you as a little bitty old kid that ran around the church. And I'm like, well, thank you. I pray for you. You're Chris and Laurie's kid, right? Oh, you're Ruth's grandson. Much easier to go into a church of people that don't know me who say, this is just our pastor. No history, no story. But Jesus looked at the people and he said, it's not about me being from here and you knowing me. He said, you're not going to see the heart that I'm trying to foster in you. You're not going to understand. And if you can't understand, I'm going to give it to somebody else. That's a hard thing for a pastor in his home church. Amen. To look at people that you have loved your entire life. And to stay up awake at night. Burdened for the hearts of people that you have loved. And it's a sting when somebody you don't know says, hey, we're not coming back to church. It's a whole double, double burn when it's somebody that you've known for years and they go... We thought you were going to be something else. 
and I can't believe you're inviting strangers into the church. These new people, you're giving it away to, to people that don't belong here. You see, Jesus looked and he said, I'm going to give this to anybody who will understand. And the Jews got mad. Why? Because Jesus came in and he tore down the country club. We have enjoyed Judaism, and we have been the ones in charge, and we have been the rule makers, and we have been this. And all of a sudden Jesus goes, yeah, I don't care. I don't care. Your hearts have become hard, and you've become calloused. You're mean and you're angry. And if you can't get it, it'll go to somebody else. Now you understand why they jumped up in the synagogue and they went, we're going to murder you. Now you understand that hatred that Jesus hit on. But here's something that we learned from the Gospel Project this morning. What is worth my discomfort? What is worth the discomfort of somebody is when you can look and say, my discomfort will ultimately bring about the comfort of many other people. Jesus goes, I'm willing to be rejected by you. I'm willing to be murdered by you. I'm willing to be set down by you so that all of these people out here will accept and will have faith. And let me tell you the beautiful thing. If your heart has been hard and calloused, and if you're sitting here right now going, mm, he's talking about me, Here's the thing. You were the Gentile that Jesus was fighting for in this story. So when you want to get super mad, and when we want to go, I really don't want to share my grace with those people. Guess what? The Jews didn't want to share it with you. And they didn't want you so much, they murdered Jesus over it. And Jesus looked at you. Here's the gospel in a nutshell. Jesus looked at you and said, It's worth the rejection of my people to make you my people. It's worth it. Guys, if that don't break your hard heart and soften you up, then it ain't an us and them. That in the church age, it's an us. We were the unloved and the outcast that Jesus came and he fought for. If you look with me really quickly, the ministry of Christ. Isaiah 61 is broken down into four different distinct chapters. You can, you can put parentheses on these. You can highlight them if you can. One through three is the ministry of Jesus Christ when he reads this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. This is why Jesus read what he read. This is specifically pointing to the Messiah. This is specifically pointing to the ministry of Jesus. I cannot pronounce the year of the Lord's favor. Only the Messiah can do that. Only he can grant beauty to those who mourn. Only He can anoint our heads with oil. Only He can give us praise instead of faintness. Only He can do all of those things. They shall build up ancient ruins. Verse 4, this is what we do. The church of Christ, not the church of Christ, but the church of Jesus Christ. The Baptists, the Church of Christ, right? The Pentecostals, all of us together, the Bride of Christ. This is what we do. We build up on ancient ruins. We raise up former devastations. We repair ruined cities. That's the job you are in. You are ministers of reconciliation. Things that have been ripped apart, you are now called to come in and build up on ancient ruins. You are remodelers. When the house is cruddy and it's crooked and it's fallen down, you are the people that God sends in to restore it and make it level. The job of the church. 7 through 9, this is what we receive from God. Instead of your shame, there will be a double portion. The portion given to the oldest child, the portion of inheritance. Instead of dishonor, you will get rejoicing. And then that last little bit, if you look, 10 through the end, this is what God is preparing for us. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me in garments of salvation, and he has covered me with the robes of righteousness. And as the earth brings forth its sprouts, as old things begin to look like new things, and as the garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all nations." 
When it comes to making disciples, we have got to stop looking at an us and them mentality. Older people are a crown jewel in the church. You've given your lives to the service of this church. But, and this isn't a shot at our church, this is a shot at the church overall. If the older generations in the church are not willing to foster and love and accept the new generations of the church, that church will die. And vice versa. If the young people kick in the door and go, it's going to be our way and we just run all you old people out. There was a story of a church. Story of a church last week in Virginia or somewhere that they literally went through their attendance roll and anybody over 60, they asked them, if you would meet over here in the side building and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna put a screen in there so that you can have it broadcast to you. But this is basically like the old people service now. Some of you are like, dude, I'm 60. I'm not old. Not my rule. That was their rule. The, this is the old people service. Because in the main sanctuary, we want youth. We want young people. What are we doing? What are we doing? For the older folks here, I see your Facebook posts. We'll touch on this just for a minute. Things are going to change. One day, they will have a new way of doing music, and I will be super mad that we don't have a projector anymore. Well, in my day, we sang off projectors, and projectors were good enough for me. Should be good enough for y'all, right? Some of you are like, I hate the projector. I have two options when it comes to making disciples. I can disagree with everything. And I can run any youthfulness out of the church. Or I can look and say, my time is just about up here. And the legacy that I can leave, the one thing that I can leave, is maybe to be discomforted a little bit when I show up. It's not really what I prefer. But for the next generation of sprouts that are coming. Do you, understand, do you understand the metaphor that Isaiah uses here? When we garden, do you understand that gardening, in order to produce seeds, something has to die? And I'm not trying to say get ready, old people. Like, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be all like that. But something has to die in order for something new to be born. Jesus is looking and he goes, I understand that you've enjoyed Judaism. I understand that you've enjoyed the way this thing has been run. And I understand that you, you really enjoy the law. It's dying. I'm killing it so that something new can be reborn. That's uncomfortable for people. We don't like change. But when we talk about making disciples, we have to. We have to be in the business of taking on discomfort for us to build you up. We have to. What a great comfort it is for us that Christ suffered on account of our story, that our groom took on the debt and the family drama and the issues of his bride. Really quickly, I thought about this when I was writing these notes. Any of you that are married, there's an old saying, and I've, I've tried to teach it to my kids and I've tried to teach it to youth down the line. When you marry somebody, you don't just marry that person, you marry their family. I love you. I'm not looking your way. When you marry somebody, <laughs> you don't just marry that person, you marry their family. Here's another hard lesson to learn. Ask questions ahead of time. When people come and sit down with me for marriage counseling, one of the questions I ask is, who's going to control the finances? Who's going to handle the money? Right? If you've been with me through marriage counseling, I've asked you this question. Who's going to handle money? And sometimes, most of the time, they've done got it figured out. Most of the time, here's what happens. I said, who's going to handle the money? And the guy looks at the woman. And I go, okay, enough said. Right? Ladies, y'all are better at that kind of thing, most of you. But there's questions that I ask. Why? And I always, always say this. Is there anything anything that you need to get off your chest right now before we go through with this marriage. And they always sit there and go, no, nope, we're good. And I'm like, stop and think about it. Give it a minute. Let it breathe. 
The reason I do that is this. When you marry somebody, you take on all of it. The good and the wonderful. You take on the debt. You take on the pains. You take on the family members that you really didn't care for. You know, the ones that you were dating and you were like, yeah, I'm going to skip Christmas because I really don't like your uncle. Well, now he's your uncle. Congratulations. Jesus did the same thing when he looked at his bride. Imagine this. Imagine Jesus looks at his bride. And imagine us in all of our dysfunction, right? And all of our family issues and all of our drama and all of our debt and all of my sin that Jesus looks at his bride and goes, yeah, I'm going to put a ring on that. All right? What a great comfort it should be that Jesus looked at us as messed up as we were and he went, I'm willing to die for you. And I'm willing to take it on. I'm willing. I'm willing to do it. I asked a kid one time, him and this girl, they were going to get married. And they were, oh, it's, it's still funny to laugh at. They were going to go on adventures. And I was like, oh, okay, adventures. That's good. And he was like, yeah, 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 we're going to go here and we're going to do this and we're going to do this. And I mean, they're just spouting off all their adventures to me. And I was like, okay. And I said, question. And I've asked some of you the same question. I said, question. Yeah, what's the question? I said, if something happens to her and she becomes paralyzed and she can no longer go with you on your adventures, right? She's physically impossible. She's bedridden. Something happens. I said, are you going to stay with her and care for your wife or are you going to go on your adventures? Do you know that was the longest pause I've ever had ever in a marriage counseling, no, no joke, marriage counseling session. He sat there and he went, that's a good question. And he looked at her and he goes, I'll think about that. And I looked at her and I was like, run. <laughs> this joker is crazy. They ended up getting married and they're on one of their adventures now. She looked at me, she's like, oh, it's going to be fine. And I'm like, whatever. <laughs> Long life. Love you. I didn't marry them, by the way. Um, they just came to me for counseling. And I, Shuffled them off to somebody else. <laughs> Guys, Jesus looked at me and he was like, I'm willing to give up everything to love you. I'm willing to give up everything, everything to call you to be my disciple. Guys, when we understand that, it's such a beautiful thing. Verse 18 in the book of Luke we see this. We find in other Gospels that Jesus had already had his encounters with the brothers and the family. As we make disciples for Christ, as we get ready to become disciples for Christ. Some of us in here, I'm talking to you about making disciples and you're not even a disciple yet. Here's a few things you need to know. It is God, number one, who calls the disciple. None of these men chose to follow on their own, but by the call of God and the obedience of Christ to preach to them. Here's why I say this, because if you are saved and you're trying to make disciples, don't beat yourself up. I stand here every week, and a lot of weeks I stand here, I fiddle with my ring, Jacob sings a song, nobody walks down and they leave. We all leave. Am I a terrible preacher? Some of you are like, yes. <laughs> Am I a terrible preacher? No. I hope not. <laughs> Has God called on somebody that day? No. Because if God called you, you would have moved. Sometimes we put the fault too much on ourselves. And I'm not saying to fault God. I'm not saying to blame God. But go to the Lord and say, God, you are the one who calls. You are the, ones that, you are the one that draws men unto yourself. And so I'm asking you for the sake of this person, draw them to you. Draw them. God, just start working in their life. You may be the example, right, as he got ready to draw Peter. He didn't draw Peter the first time he met him. But you may be the example or one of the situations in this person's life that helps them to be drawn to God. So you don't take it personally. Because too often we beat ourselves up. Now, here's for all of you that are unsaved. If you're not into making disciples but you're not yet a disciple for Christ, here's the big thing. God's going to draw you. God is going to hit you, and He's going to draw you to Himself. Don't fight that. You know that feeling when you can't eat and you can't sleep, and everybody around you, for whatever reason, has been talking about Jesus, and you're just like, oh, I just don't want to. Stop. 
You're here today for a reason. God has set you in this sanctuary for a reason today. And maybe it was because mom and dad drug me to this church. They made me come. Maybe it was because somebody invited me. Maybe it's because I've been a member here for years and years and years. Whatever. You're here today for a specific purpose. God is drawing you. Secondly, God will often give extended grace the means that we may be just one salvation away from changing not only one life, but an entire home or entire community. When we talk about making disciples, guys, extended grace in this. Jacob was my target, but when I get Jacob saved, all of a sudden Jacob's kids are coming to Christ. If you can get one person, you don't know the difference in generation. You don't know the difference, man. If that one person has six kids and all them kids grow up in a godly home and they all proclaim Christ and you, six pastors, pastors, wives, ministers, I mean, whatever, you can directly affect those generational things. But in order to do that, you have to preach. In order to do that, you have to be faithful to what God is calling you to do. Lastly, Peter caught a ton of fish. Peter caught a ton of fish. You'd look at Peter on that one day and go, you're a terrible fisherman. Right? T Peter wasn't a terrible fisherman. Right? Peter, he'd, he'd been fishing a long time. He had caught a ton of fish in the past. But Jesus said, it's time to go, Peter. And what did Peter do? He left to follow the one who had captivated his heart. When God is drawing you in to be a disciple, guys, there's a lot of us here that we have been wildly successful in life. That we have all the comforts, that we have all of our life planned out. When Jesus Christ calls you, you're going to change. They say you should never judge a man's salvation. I don't know if that's true or not. I think Paul judged a whole bunch of people's salvation. Paul looked at people in the book of Corinthians and went, just give him over to the devil. If he wants the devil so bad, give him over. I'll tell you this. People can look at you. This should make you self-conscious. People can look at you and within just a few minutes can know if you're a disciple of Christ or not. Not if you're saved. That's not the question. A disciple, if you are one who is chasing after your master. Because what happened in Peter's life? Peter no longer smelt like fish. Peter no longer carried around nets. He was no longer down by the lake. Peter's life changed. And so when you become a disciple of Christ, guys, I'm going to tell you, for those of you here that you're like, man, I've been feeling God drawn on me, your life is going to change. You're going to, there's going to, you're going to suffer some loss. And things are going to shift and they're going to change. But I guarantee you, on the authority of the Word, on the authority of the Bible, that what we have now is nothing in comparison to the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Paul says, I count it all as rubbish, garbage, feces it's nothing compared to what I have in Christ so if you're here and you're like man I just need a relationship with God I need to get right with Jesus maybe you're here and you're like I've, I've been saved and I want to get baptized I want to join a local church I want to I I become a disciple of Christ I want to get further into this invitation is going to be a little different today I'm going to be in the back. Lights are going to be off. There's a short video clip I want to show you guys. I know we're over time already. There's just a short video clip. It's from a, an app. It's called The Chosen. It's really well done. It's probably, I told everybody Wednesday night, this is probably the best rendition of Jesus and the gospel that I've ever seen. And guys, at any time during this video, as we watch, as Jesus calls his disciples, if you need to come and pray and just say, you know what, I, I just need a relationship with Christ. It's just going to be me and you back in the back. And I want to pray with you and I want to love you. So as we prepare, let's pray. Father, God, I pray that you would just prepare our hearts right now.